Uh, this is week number six in our series, 10 Choices to Change Your Life Forever. And uh, you know that sometimes Christians are kind of wimpy about responsibility. I don't know if you know that or not, but um, I'll just put myself in the group. How many people here consider yourself a Christian? All right, sorry, this, so this is like family talk, all right, and I'm including myself in this. Sometimes we're just kind of wimpy about choices and responsibility. We're like, well, you know what? God is in control. I believe that, amen? God is in control. God is absolutely in control. But as I've said throughout this series, do not lose your sense of responsibility in the sea of God's sovereignty. Do not do that. You are responsible. In fact, did you know that the Bible is loaded with volitional terminology? Words that indicate that we have choices to make. Here are some of the words. Uh, choose, elect, determine, resolve, purpose, consent, wish, will, desire, uh, listen, obey, submit, walk, observe, do, yield, accept, reject, spurn, refuse, rebel, unwilling. I could go on for a long time with all of the words in the Bible that talk about the choices that people are making. Yeah, yeah there's no doubt about it. God is in control. That's going to be a great spot for an amen. There's no doubt about it. God is in control. All right, But that does not lessen our sense of responsibility. In fact, did you know that the most, uh, in the Old Testament, the most common Hebrew term for choose is the word bahar. It appears 172 times in the Old Testament. It connotes a careful choice, a decision reached after a matter has been looked into carefully. In the New Testament, the most common Greek term for choose is the term uh, othello. It's used 208 times in the New Testament, almost once per chapter. Uh, we see these ter- the, this word for choosing, for deciding. And actually, uh, the, in the New Testament, it's kind of like three levels, the way this word is. Uh, the first level is just kind of desiring. That's not quite choosing. It's my wish, I, I want, I, I long for. Um, um, like Paul said, I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. And many of our desires go unfulfilled. Those are not choices. But a second way that the word, uh, idea behind the word is is the idea of consenting. That's an agree to participate in a certain action that's presented to you. But then your will's only engaged kind of passively. Like if somebody says, hey, do you want to go with me? And you're like, "Mm, sure. And so you're, you're along basically on someone else's will. But the main idea is not desire or consent. The main uh, and most important concept is this idea of decision. At this level, the person chooses to undertake a certain course of action. He is active rather than passive. Uh, Her will is fully engaged. Uh, He will act possibly directing others to do the same. All right, And that's what we're going for in this series. We're going for your will to be fully engaged. I mean completely plugged in to these choices that we've been talking about and considering. Uh, Two identity choices. I am, um, what was that identity choice again? I am, um, I am, um, nobody wants to say and get the wrong, but I totally didn't forget. I'm loved by God, I'm forgiven by God. I'm just messing with you to see if you know. All right, two identity choices, I'm loved by God, I'm forgiven by God. Two authority choices, which were, um, 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 I believe the Bible is, well the first one actually was I choose Jesus Christ as Lord. The second one was I choose the Bible as God's word. Identity choices, authority choices, then capacity choices. I can't change the past, I choose to forgive. I can't, ch- I can't control the future, I choose to trust. And so we've had two identity choices, two authority choices, two capacity choices. Hopefully by now you're wondering what's going to be the next couplet. Here it is. Two priority choices. Two priority choices. Jot this down. Good choices require established priorities, okay? If you're gonna make good choices, you have gotta have established priorities. The word priority means an authoritative uh, rating which establishes precedence. That's what a priority is. It's an authoritative rating. You have all these different opportunities and then you uh, authoritatively rate those things and establish precedent. What comes first? What comes second? What comes third? Priorities. Hey, did you hear about this guy, by the way? How many people like read the newspaper and stuff like that? How many people like to read? Did you read? Did you hear about this this guy? I mean, this happens every day, I guess, but I mean, it's not like he started with nothing, okay? But I mean, this guy made it rich, okay? I mean, he, did you hear about this guy? 
he totally, totally struck it rich. And it wasn't like he started with nothing, though. I mean, he did sort of have a silver spoon in his mouth when he started. But, um, but I mean, he didn't just sit back and lay back on it. I mean, he risked it, and he went for it, and he took everything that he was born into this world with, and his family gave him, and he, like, put it all on the line. And, I mean, he hit it big. I mean, he, it, rolling in it, uh, sleeping on it, uh, I mean, like, he hit it so big time, it's unbelievable. Kind of like, um, I was thinking about some parallels to this guy, like in the 70s on television, it was like the Thurston Howell move, okay? Or, or uh, not on television, but uh, in real life, uh, you could say that in the 70s, it was Howard Hughes. In the 80s on television, this guy would have been J.R. Ewing, you know, remember him? And I'm not trying to forget, right? Or, or William Randolph Hearst, maybe. In the 90s, it would be like Mr. Burns, you know, excellent, if you know who he is. And some people are like, who's that? Yeah, figure it out. And, and, uh, or Bill Gates. Now, interestingly, uh, in this decade, uh, television and reality have come together, and it would just be Donald Trump, you know? And, and just the guy who's absolutely, the guy that I'm talking about is like that. I mean, absolutely rolling in it. And I mean, I guess there's always been people like this, but... Um, this guy had so much, like, has so much, he doesn't even know where to store it all. I mean, he doesn't even flat out know where to store it all. In fact, as he started collecting it all, he was like, you know what? I don't even have enough room uh, in my barns uh, to put this stuff away. So he was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones to store all my stuff. And I'm not talking about regular barns here. I'm talking about air-conditioned, concrete floor, acres and acres of barns to store all of his stuff. But then did you hear what happened to the guy? Because, I mean, no sooner did he get... Um, the barn's up and all of his stuff stored away. No, no sooner did he get a glass of iced tea in his hand and was he sitting on a lounge chair by the pool and the guy like has a heart attack and dies just like that. Did you hear about that guy? It's right here. Uh, he's in Luke chapter 6. Jesus told us about this guy. I think you'll recognize him in the story. Luke chapter uh, 6. Verses 19 through 21. Hmm, it's not in Luke. Luke 12, 16 through 21. You know, one of the great things about having a Bible church is <laughs> if you ever get lost, they can help you find yourself. Thank you. I'm there now. I'm there now. Luke 12, let me read. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? Notice the usage of the word I in the text. You're going to see it six times. What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my, oh, that's used there too, five times, my crops. And, uh, and of course, what should he have done when he found out that he had more than he needed? He should have thought about giving and blessing and sharing. Blessed to be a blessing. But... Uh, why did, why did he have no room to store his crops? Well, because he hadn't even used everything he got from last harvest. So his barns were full from last year, and then he brings in this harvest, and he's like, what am I going to do now? He had so much. So he said to himself, verse 18, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods, and I will say to my soul, kind of arrogant there, sort of talking to yourself, I'll say to my soul, soul? You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, the main principle here, of course, is the use of money. But the fundamental failure is a failure of priorities. That's the main failure. The guy was not passive. He, he was making choices, but he was making bad choices because he had wrong priorities. It wasn't like he was sitting back doing nothing. He was doing something. A lot of people in the world would applaud this guy and say he was doing something substantive with his life. But in the final analysis, his choices were self-destructive. He thought, notice in the text, for example, he thought that personal pleasure was the highest good. I, 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 my, my, my. He thought that everything that he had was for himself. 
He thought that time was indefinite. He thought that, as so many think, my life will just go on and on and on. I can choose as I want. I'll never have to account for my priorities. He thought life was indefinite. He thought, sadly, he thought that God could be monkeyed with. He thought that God could be marginalized. He thought that God could be mocked. Galatians 6, 7 says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. You can't mock God. You can't get away, ultimately, with bad priorities. Wrong choices were flowing from wrong priorities. And I, before we're too hard on the guy, I think he might have meant well. I think he may have felt, I, I can't just waste what I have. I, I, I mean, surely he intended to, to uh, get to what matters at some point in his life. But note this, and this is very instructive for me. A good heart with bad priorities still leads to bad choices. And that's a lot of you. We've all been there at times in our life. You have a good heart. You want to do the right thing, but you have bad priorities. So when the chips are down, you make uh, bad choices. Now, notice again in verse 21. So was the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Priorities, first things first. Stick to stuff that matters. Here's a verse that's really helped me. I memorized this. Write down the reference. Proverbs 4, 26. It says, ponder the path of your feet and let all of your ways be established. In other words, think about your life. Think about where you're going, where your feet are taking you, where your choices are taking you. Think about that. Proverbs 4, 26, ponder the path of your feet and let all of your ways be established, agreed upon, written down, reviewed, taught to others. You say, well, doesn't everyone have priorities? Sadly, no. I wonder, I wonder honestly, do you have priorities? Do you have things that when it comes right down to it, I will not do this because I'm going to do this all the time. Jot these down. Four reasons we give for not establishing priorities. Uh, number one, <laughs> I don't know where you live, man, but I am too busy surviving. And I don't spend a lot of time making choices about what's important. Maybe Pastor James could do that, but I don't have a lot of time to make choices I'm just trying to survive, man. I'm just trying to get through another day. I do what has to be done from the moment I get up until the moment I go to sleep. Is that working for you? Do you even buy that yourself, that your life wouldn't be better with some better priorities? Four reasons we give for not establishing priorities. I'm too busy surviving or there's too many things that are important. My career's important, financial security, the kids, the sports. The education, my church, the hobbies. Man, I feel like my head's going to explode sometime. Everything's important. You feel like that? Like everything's important? Like the phone always rings on the loudest tone for everything. If you feel like that, it's because you don't have priorities. You haven't uh, decided for yourself and for your family what's going to be most important. Reasons we give for not establishing priorities. Here's a third one. Some people think priorities are too narrow. Man, man, I, I, I get that at work. I sure get that at church. When I get to my house, man, I just want to be a little more, hey, 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 laid back a little bit. I want to take it easy, man. I don't need someone banging me all the time about what matters. I'll tell you what matters. Nothing matters. I love it when nothing matters, man. What are you going to do today? I don't know. I love days like that. And I don't need all that heavy duty, what's important stuff, man. Get off my back. That's your life, is it? You think it's too narrow to have priorities? Or too restrictive, too judgmental, you might say. Hey, 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 I might have some personal priorities, but I mean, far be it from me. I mean, who am I to judge? I mean, to each his own. I'm going to let my kids make up their own mind what their priorities are. I mean, I mean, how could I possibly decide for them? They got to, you know, and, and, and let's just, it's too judgmental, man. Too busy surviving, too many important things, too narrow, too judgmental. And, and I, just, I just want to take it easy, man. I mean, just, it's all good. Just, just, it's all good. Is it? It's all good. Is it? Everything in your life, it's all good. 
I'm not really buying that. Are you buying that? I mean, you look in the mirror and say, I'm telling you, man, it is so perfect right now. Well, for my house, one of the ways that we tried to work on priorities, I've told you this before in years gone by, but I'm happy to come back to it, is we've had these five family values. They're like our priorities. And you've been to our house, uh, and, and it's everywhere we've ever lived, it's written on the wall, as big as life. And, and uh, um, always pointing to them. Our five family values are uh, love God. Obviously, that's number one, the vertical. Number two, or number one in terms of people, love God, family first. Drill that into our kids constantly. Love God, family first. Work hard. Nothing's for free. Work hard. Tell the truth. If you don't have the truth, you have nothing. Love God, family first, work hard, tell the truth, be kind. People matter. People matter to God. If you get it wrong, humble yourself and go back to the person and get it right. Love God, family first, work hard, tell the truth, be kind. I'm not saying that should be your list. I'm just saying I've got one. And, uh, and priorities, and, and they're a driving force behind a life well lived. And God help us. Remember the kids growing up, discuss these things frequently, constantly refer to them, point out examples of people that aren't getting those priorities. Talk about and celebrate people that are getting those priorities. Just people always say to us, did you have a family Bible study on Tuesday afternoons? And we never did that at our house. We read God's word frequently, we prayed together often, and we talked constantly about God's priorities for this world and for our family and how they were being lived out on a day-to-day basis, individually and as a family. And uh, which leads to this. Now turn back the page to Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, and jot down this second thing. Good choices require established priorities. <clears throat> Number two, I cannot fail at family. So here, here's a priority. Whatever I fail at in this world, God help me, I cannot fail at family. Matthew 5, 32 says, But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That's family failure. And that's a failure in priorities. The context, of course, is verse 31, uh, where Jesus is uh, re-emphasizing something from uh, Deuteronomy 24.1 where he says, uh, verse 31 here, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. See, Jesus here is not even really making a statement about the rightness or wrongness of divorce in a particular situation. He's assuming it. And, and the, the Bible uh, in other places has a lot to say about the wrongness of divorce, but that's not, I mean, for example, in Malachi 2, it says that God hates divorce. But here what he's really saying is, is that uh, it's never a great idea, the whole message of the Bible. Uh, has to do with uh, fight, resist, hold off on, uh, work uh, to keep uh, family failure from happening. Now, uh, the purpose of this message is not to give a lengthy teaching on divorce, and I know that uh, what I've said already raises questions in people's minds, and uh, there's a Walk in the Word uh, tape that you can get. I didn't uh, prepare this soon enough to have it ready for you today. Uh, but it's called, What Does the Bible Say About Divorce? We'll just make up a whole bunch of them. We'll put, the, put it on the internet this week. You can download it and listen to it if that's something that you need more teaching on. Uh, but my point is to say this. I've never met a person who loves the Lord who went through the pain of divorce who wouldn't say, do whatever you can to keep that from ever happening to anyone you know. It, it is a devastating and destructive thing. Divorces in America are one million per year now. When you realize that that includes two people, that's two million people per year uh, going through divorce. People will often say, well, isn't like 50% of all marriages end in divorce? Uh, Not exactly. Uh, In 1996, uh, 69% of the men and 76% of the women were still in their first marriage. 11 years later, by 2007, 54% of married men and 58% of married women are still uh, in their first marriage. But I don't think anyone would debate the fact that uh, divorce is destructive. Uh, Margaret Atwood, a Canadian writer, said, divorce is like an amputation. You survive it, but there's less of you. And, and uh, Now that's just uh, a separation between a husband and wife. 
Uh, sadly, of course, one of the reasons why the divorce rate is falling in our country is because less and less people are just flat out just not getting married. What they're doing instead is they're just living together, uh, living in sin, uh, that used to be called. And uh, the Bible calls it fornication. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, uh, that those who uh, practice or have as their life the habit of fornication will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, interestingly, uh, those who do choose to live together rather than get married, only 10% of those people are together after five years. And so a person just moves and moves. There's no commitment. There's nothing to undergird and hold up that relationship. Now, we track divorce because it's a legal matter. You've got to go to court to get a divorce. Uh, but that's only one part of family failure. What about, what about separation between parents and children? What about separations between brothers and sisters? What about separation between children and parents? Well, all of these things have a devastating impact. Now, you've got to know that I know uh, that standing here the last uh, seven or eight minutes of what I've said, I'm not talking about people out there. Up and down these rows all over our church here are people who have been through family breakdown, devastating things. Many of you could stand up and say, that's the, that's the story through which I found the Lord. And, and I believe that God's grace extends uh, to all kind of failure, including family failure, amen? But, but, but what do you do after that? Uh, well, obviously, I believe with all of my heart, look up here for a minute, I believe with all of my heart that failure is not final. And so you find yourself uh, kind of standing between two things here. Those of you who have not experienced significant family failure, I would exhort you to avoid it at all cost, as anyone who is in here who has uh, would tell you. Those of you who have experienced family failure, God's grace provides for your future and should produce in your heart a determined effort to show your gratitude for God's grace by making sure that your priorities indicate that you will never get to that place uh, in your life again. Amen? Amen? So we consider it together and establish this priority. I mean, I just cannot fail at family. Whatever I get done in my career, whatever I get done in my church, whatever I get done in my financial practices, whatever I get done in whatever I get done, I cannot fail at family. You can take over the world and lose your family and die a miserable person. But you can fail to accomplish a lot of other things. But if your children rise up and call you blessed and gather around your feet and you pray and wait for your prodigals to come home till the end of your life, nothing will bring you joy. Like seeing God's grace in your lifetime and in eternity demonstrated in the lives of those you love most, those we call family. Now, I cannot fail at family. It's to be fought, it's to be resisted at all cost. The good news of the gospel is, is that because of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, Jesus' blood, like Noah's flood, covers family failure and gives me the opportunity to begin again, to rise from the soot of selfishness and establish priorities for my future, to rise from the tattered shreds of torn dreams and purpose to make better choices, to lift myself from the shame of my past and the disappointment of family issues and show my sincerity to God by purposing afresh to establish his priorities for my family. This will help you. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Good choices require established priorities. I cannot fail at family. I love this passage here, so much so that I tried to get you to turn to it earlier. <laughs> my, my family is treasure. My family is treasure to me. And, and your family ought to be treasure to you. You would rather go to the bank now take out everything you have and burn it in the parking lot than lose a member of your family in any way. Family is treasure. Notice in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. It's talking about money, of course. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. The only th two things were taken to heaven. I was taught this was when I was a little kid. Only two things were taken to heaven. You know what they are? People and God's word. That's it. God's word, that's going to heaven. And the people around us, that's going to heaven. We're going to heaven together, amen? That's all we're taking. Hold it up. What are we taking? First of all, hold it up. We're taking God's word and then just pat somebody next to you on the shoulder and God's people, all right? That's all we're taking. 
I'm telling you, all the rest of this stuff's going to burn. It's going to rot, okay? So when it says, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, it can only mean those things. Nothing else is going with. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Here's the verse. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Whatever you treasure, that's where your heart is. Whatever matters most to you, that's where your heart is. Underline that in your Bible. Good job. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. Lift up your voice. Let's say that. What is it? Where your treasure is, there your heart is. All together now. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. Okay? And the reverse is also true. Where your heart is, it's where your treasure is. Whatever you value, whatever matters most to you, whatever is treasure to you, that's where your heart is. If your treasure is your career, your heart will be there. If your treasure is your reputation, what people say about you, that's where your heart is. If your treasure is your possessions, what you have and what you've accumulated, that's where your heart is. If your treasure is your investments and your future and your security and setting yourself up, that's where your heart is. If your treasure is some secret private pleasure, right or wrong, that's where your heart is. And if your heart is there, you'll give your time to it, you'll give your energies to it, and you'll give your first thoughts and your best resources to what you treasure. My family is my treasure. My family is my treasure. My spouse, if you're blessed to have one. My parents, my my brothers, my sisters, my children. My family is my treasure. My family is my treasure. Take for a moment and just imagine with me for a minute. Just use your mind and engage with me. Think of your greatest joys. Most people would say, my greatest joys are my family joys. Think of your greatest burdens. Most people would say, my greatest burdens are my family burdens. (laughs) True or false? Why? Because it's my treasure. It matters most to me. Think of your greatest sorrows. Your greatest sorrows are your family sorrows. But think of your greatest happinesses. Your greatest happinesses are your family happinesses. My family is my treasure. My family is my treasure. Now that's not just a sentiment. That's a priority choice that needs to be riveted. You say, well, how how do I keep first things first? Where your treasure is, there your heart is. What you give yourself to. You say, how do I make my family my treasure all the time? Well, it's two things. And, And they're really just little simple things. I'm not a super smart guy. But I think if you really do these things, I think they'll really help you. First thing in terms of treasuring your family, it involves some stuff you just stay out of it, okay? There's some things you just got to keep your nose out of it, okay? Treasuring isn't just, I'm going to tell you about something you do in a minute, but it's also what you don't do. There's some things you just got to keep your nose out of it. Turn to your neighbor and say, keep your nose out of it. Oh, easy, 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 easy. There's some things you just got to, hey, did you hear about this? (laughs) Did you hear about this guy? There was this guy who bought this Ferrari, and he was so proud of his car. He was so impressed with himself. He spent, can you believe it? He spent $160,000 on a car. And he was driving around town with the windows down. He just wanted everyone to look at him. And he was so impressed with himself. Until this older guy pulls up beside him on a moped. And he kind of looked over at him like this. And he wanted him, so he raced the engine, you know. But the old guy wasn't super impressed. But he kept racing the engine. And finally, the older guy couldn't take it anymore. So he kind of looked over and said, nice car you got there. And, and the f- guy in the Ferrari was like, yes. Yes, it is a nice car. And, and he said, yeah, yeah, that's great. And he asked him a couple of questions. And so he kind of poked his head and kind of looked in the window of the car. Just then, the light turns green. So the guy hits the, <laughs> hits the gas pedal. wanted to impress the guy in the moped. So he hits the gas pedal, speeds off up to 80 miles an hour, squealing rubber down the street. And um, all of a sudden, he looks in his rearview mirror, and he sees this dot coming toward him. I mean, fast, really fast, and racing past him. 
the other way. On What on earth? And then he looks out in front and he sees the dot coming back his way, racing shoo, right past him again. He thinks to himself, I think that was the old guy on the moped. Then he looks in his rearview mirror and he sees the dot coming back toward his car again. Bam! It slams right in the back of his car. He jumps out of the car and he goes over. Oh, this is the old guy in the moped. And he's laying there and he says, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Say something. And the old guy says, um, yeah, uh, unhook my suspenders from your side view mirror. <laughs> He got his nose in the wrong place, you know? <laughs> Snooping around. I thought that was a funny story. <laughs> it's so easy though, isn't it? To get kind of looking around at things that don't matter, sniffing into stuff that's not my business, wasting my energies and my efforts on things that really aren't my priority. The first part of making my family truly my treasured priority, the first part of it is, there's just some things you gotta keep your nose out of. I'm just, I don't have time to care about that. I don't have time to think about that. I'm not going to be knowledgeable about that. I'm not going to be up to date on that. I've got to take care of the treasure. It's what you keep your nose out of. But then it's also what you're into. If you want your family to truly be your treasure, your parents, your aunts and uncles, your brothers and sisters, I don't know your whole family makeup, but if you want your family to truly be your treasure, you have to be really into your family. You've got to give it time, 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 attention, energy. <laughs> I don't think it's any secret that I absolutely adore my wife, Kathy. Uh, this summer, we're married for 25 years. And, um, and uh, I tell you, I adore her because it's true. But it's also truer because I tell you, both is true. And there's a choice to revel in another person and to make them your treasure. There's so many things about Kathy that I love, but one of the things that I love about her is, is that she is so into pictures. Every place we've ever lived from the little basement apartment, we first got married when we were both in college full time, she covered the apartment with pictures. So I brought some pictures here to show you. And um, first of all, I thought you'd like this one. That's Kathy and I when we were dating. This hangs at our entryway. You're like, wow, you, you, you don't uh, look, look, look the... Uh... Yeah, well, you don't either. <laughs> You're like, but, but Kathy, she still looks amazing. I know, what can I tell you? Okay, so that's one picture. And then, these are all hanging in our house <clears throat> and have been for a long time. This is a picture that my parents sent us several years ago. It's a picture of my mom and dad in the middle on their wedding day. And then me and each of my three brothers on their wedding day. It's always hung uh, at the front door of our house. It's a really big deal. I don't ever want to lose what's in this picture. And I don't ever want one of my brothers to ever lose what they had on that day. My parents wrote a little note on the back, to our children, look after each other, Hebrews 12, 13. Encourage one another, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Be tenderhearted to each other, Ephesians 4, 32. Keep your promises, Colossians 3, 9. Live in peace with one another, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 13. Remember, life isn't always fair, but that's all right, James 1, 12. Take up for each other. Be loyal as a great treasure. See, treasure, Proverbs 26. And then, but remember, most of all, love one another deeply from the heart. 1 Peter 1, love mom and dad. It's a big deal. And, and you have to value it and treasure it. This is what Kathy always reminds me when I'm like, how much was that frame? <laughs> and then, <laughs> hanging always uh, in our bedroom is this picture. This is Luke and Landon and Abby. Yeah, they, they don't uh, look like that anymore. <laughs> and, um, but it's a reminder of innocence and what a treasure our children are. And, and uh, to never lose that and to never let go of that. And um, then, yeah, she, some people stop taking pictures when their kids aren't little, not Kathy. Now she's really into these murals. 
And uh, so there's, I bet you, five or six or seven of these hanging around our house. Just pictures, I don't even remember what this one's. Luke and Kristen getting married and Landon graduating from college. And uh, Lindsay and Alexis, I think, on uh, somebody's birthday, Abby's birthday maybe. I don't know. Just collages of family. And Kathy has at our house 60 photo albums. Every one of them filled every page Thousands of pages, all creative memories. If you do creative memories, you know how long that takes. 60 albums. She spent so much time on this. What's she saying? She's saying it's a treasure. It's my treasure. It matters. Nothing matters more than this. And she's teaching us to treasure it too. Where your treasure is, it's where your heart is. It's where your heart is. My family is my treasure. From the beginning... God, uh, good choices require established priorities. I cannot fail at family. My family is my treasure. Now, lastly, I choose to love my family as my highest human priority. I say human because we, <laughs> we don't worship our family, amen? We worship God. And if you let your family get more important than God, that's not going to be great. And I'll never forget, I've told this story many years ago when I took my two boys up onto a hillside uh, and one by one and prayed with them and told them, I can never love you more than I love God. And that's the lesson of Abraham and Isaac. And you put your kids in danger when you love them more than you love God. And by putting God first, you actually put your children in a better position because God then is your partner That's why I said it that way. I choose to love my family as my highest human priority. Well, this is the year of harvest love, so let's just do for about two or three minutes a little review. And let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13, and let me show you something specifically I showed you uh, back at the end of the summer. I choose to love my family as my highest human priority. I pointed out to you from 1 Corinthians 3, verse 8, uh, that it says, love never fails. Don't you think that's an awesome, awesome assertion? You think about all of the challenges in your life relationally. You think about all the things in your family that you'd like to see grow, improve, change, heal, be transformed. You think of all of those things in your family. I'm going to tell you this. Love never fails. You're like, never fails what? Great question. Look right in 1 Corinthians 13. First of all, love never fails to conquer the selfishness in me. I am a selfish person. That was a great spot to say, so am I. (laughs) I am a selfish person. I am a selfish person. Love conquers the selfishness in me. Notice it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, love is patient, it's kind, because it's not selfish. Love does not envy or boast because it's not selfish. Love is not arrogant or rude because it's not selfish. Love does not insist on its own way because it's not selfish. It's not irritable or resentful. And when it is, it's being selfish. Love isn't like that. Love conquers the greatest obstacle to family harmony in me. I'm selfish. Love conquers the greatest obstacle to family harmony in me. I'm selfish. And God gives you the capacity to conquer that through love. Notice also that uh, love, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love conquers skepticism. Love bears all things. Bl- bl- why? Well, because it, it's, because it's, it's not skeptical. Love bears all things. It just keeps believing Love just keeps on believing that you'll change. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love just keeps on going. It's not disappointed for very long. It's not disillusioned. Its eyes aren't even on you. It's on God who can do more in you than he's done yet. Love conquers selfishness, the biggest obstacle in me. Love conquers skepticism, the biggest obstacle between us. And then I love this. Love conquers the status quo the biggest issue ahead of us. The biggest issue facing most families is just flipping pages on the calendar. 
And on we go, and on we go, and on we go. Not a lot of leadership, not a lot of focus, not a lot of priorities. Just getting the paycheck, spending the money, sending the kids off to school, getting them fed and getting them to bed. Just going along. Nothing big, nothing powerful, nothing focused, nothing compelling. Love conquers that when it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 6, love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. Love is motivated to make things better. Love never fails to conquer, to obliterate. I told you at the end of summer, love is relational dynamite. Look up here for a minute. Because most of you, when you hear a message like this on the family, the first thought that you have is the obstacles you see around you to getting to that place. (laughs) I'd go there, but you don't know my mom. I'd go there, but you don't know my spouse. I'd go there, but you don't have the kids I have or the blended family. I mean, I'm telling you, Love is relational dynamite. Love obliterates the obstacles in the path of where God wants to take your family. And you are the instrument of God's love. I wrote this for you. Love your family by choosing to serve them when they choose to be selfish. Love your family by choosing to humble yourself when conflict creates distance. You be the one. You go back. You say you're sorry. You melt the ice. You take the first step. Love your family by uh, lavishing words and deeds of kindness and affirmation upon them. Lavish them. You cannot say too many kind things to your family. You, You cannot say too many complimentary things to your wife. You might have to pick her up off the floor. But you can't, honey, you look lovely today. That was, a, that was an amazing meal. I'm so thankful for the effort you put forth. Where would I be without you? Never wasted. Lavish your family with words of affirmation and deeds of kindness. Love your family by serving them and humbling yourself and lavishing and love your family by forgiving them. That's a loving act to forgive someone, to release a person from the obligation that resulted when they injured you. I'm I'm not not keeping score. I'm not trying to get even. You don't owe me. You don't have to pay me back. God's forgiven me. We've been through this. I choose to forgive. It's an act of love. Love your family by speaking God's word and God's heart in any situation regardless of the cost. Love your family by standing for God and for truth. You say, who can love like that? The answer is no one can. Only Christ in you can love someone like that. Jesus Christ is the capacity to love. I choose to love my family as my highest human priority. Let's bow together and pray about that.